welcome. This is Friday, September 4th, 2020. This is the House, uh, Human, House, <laughs> House Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and we're joined by members of the House Ways and Means Committee. And today we're going to be taking a look at uh, homeschooling. Uh, there is a question on how that affects the ADM count, which affects obviously tax rates. So our interest today is to understand a little bit better about how the uh, Agency of Ever Education oversees um, homeschooling and to just help us understand that program a little bit better, as well as understanding what the impact is, the changes compared to where we were this time last year. So I want to welcome Anne uh, Bordenaro and Alicia Hanrahan from the Agency of Education. So. Um, Anne, can we start with you? You're, You're muted, muted Anne. Anne. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm Anne Bordenaro. I'm the Division Director of Federal and Education Support Programs at the agency. And I'm joined with my colleague, Alicia Hanrahan, who's the Interagency Programs Coordinator and the Home Study Manager. We prepared a little bit of a um, presentation for you all, um, some of the questions we anticipated that you might have. So um, if you'd like, we can just sort of tag team and go through that material, or um, if you want to start with specific questions, either works for us. Let's start with, with, with your document. So Phil, if you could bring that up. Sure, uh, and I can share my screen if you'd like. Yeah, I'm gonna, I don't have the document, so I'm gonna make you a co-host. Okay. And in a moment, you should be able to share your screen. And if you could send that document to Phil as well, that would be most helpful. Sure, I, uh, I actually had sent it to Suzanne to share with you all, but I just did that this morning. Um, I apologize, this is my first time doing testimony, so I wasn't sure of the protocol. <laughs> um, okay, can you all see the document now? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so we thought we would give you a little bit of background on where we are in terms of home study numbers compared to a so-called normal year. Um, as of August 27th of last year, we had 2024 enrollments in home study. Um, and that, is not the final number for the year. However, that's pretty close to the final number for the year because August 1st, as we'll explain in a minute, is the usual deadline for home study enrollments. Um, this year on August 27th, we had 4,455 and um, 2,706 of those have been processed. Another 1749 as of the 27th were um, in process of being processed or enrolled. And we have more coming in every day. So that number obviously will be higher. Um, we're now another 10 days or so past that date. So um, in terms of enrollment deadlines, and maybe I'll stop, we didn't put this in the presentation, but the question about who is a home study kid is probably helpful in this confusion around all the hybrid learning models and all. Home study is a specific program. You have to enroll in home study. You have to basically go come out of enrollment in your public school and enroll in home study. You have to be enrolled in one or the other. So all of the different virtual learning options or remote learning options that schools are offering their students, which could be entirely um, uh, virtual, it could be hybrid, some in-person virtual, it could be entirely in-person, all it could be VTVLC enrollment through the school, all of those are not home study. So it, Home study, in, to be in home study, you have to go through a process of enrolling in home study, which means you're no longer enrolled as a public school student. It just so happens that this year, our public schools are offering a whole lot of at-home learning opportunities for students because of COVID, but that is not the same as home study. It, if I can add something else, Anne. Um, Good morning, my name is Alicia Hanrahan and I supervise the home study team. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing a, a really big increase um, with this year is families who are opting for homeschooling, but they're, um, they're using like a virtual academy. So in other states, there might be like a Liberty Online Academy or um, 
I'm trying to think, the Justin Morgan, or, you know, there's a variety of different um, virtual online academies that are not approved by, by uh, the state of Vermont. So that is also, while they're enrolled in, in a virtual academy, they still need to fill out the home study paperwork. Um, so we have a lot of families who are opting for that this year, um, which I think is a significant increase from previous years. Um, yes. and, just, and just to also let you know that by the end of the 2019-20 um, school year, we did have about 5,000 kids total enrolled for last year. Um, and we're, we're anticipating um, doubling that, I would say this year. Um, Scott Beck, you had a question? And you said that home study are people that are not, kids that are not enrolled in a public school. Does that include kids that are from a district in a, in a particular grade that tuition's out? No, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alicia, but if you're, you're still enrolled in your school, if your school or your district, if your district has an arrangement to tuition you out to an, another school because they don't operate a high school, for example, you're still enrolled in that school. That still is, that school has an arrangement to transfer the funds or pay or right. I'm not sure how it works. Yeah, no, I'm talking about, for example, you have a, a tenth grader that's from a district that uh, tuitions out the tenth grade, and that child decides to home study, and so the district doesn't take doesn't pay public tuition. Is that is that student um, counted towards your home study? Yes. So if okay. you can't you, you can't use public funds to uh, pay for any sort of home study program. Okay. Thank you. Does that, does that help? Okay. As some of these questions we may answer as we go along. Um, so in terms of the enrollment deadline, this was a confusing thing this year because everyone in the beginning thought it was August first. We do have an August first deadline for one component of it, but in general, a parent can enroll in home study at any point up to May 1st for that school year. And we had to set a deadline at some point because you know it, it, you have to submit end of year assessment material, for example. So May 1st seemed like a logical ending point. But a parent could enroll in December, they could enroll in January, they can enroll pretty much any time up to May 1st for that school year. They also can unenroll at any time and re-enroll in their, in their local public school. August 1st is, however, the deadline if they want to qualify for an exemption from something called the minimum course of study, which we'll explain in a minute. There's a statute, um, there's an exemption allowed in statute where after a certain period of time of submitting this MCOS minimum course of study, um, then parents can, um, who have continuously enrolled their student and followed all the requirements, cannot have to do that. Basically, um, you want to explain that a little bit, Alicia? Sure. Uh, the minimum course of study is really the curriculum. So families are required to um, submit the um, an enrollment form and a curriculum and, and a variety of other things um, to be able to enroll in a home study program. So they have to be able to show us how they're going to provide reading, writing, math, um, history, civics, government. Um, you know all of the all of the areas required in the minimum course of study. Um, if Families provide all of the information um, and then the following at the end of the school year, they have to provide an end of the year assessment so we can see their, um, the progress that the students have made. And then if they get all of their information in plus their enrollment for the following year, um, by that time on the third consecutive year, and there's a few other nuances, but um, the, the, the basics are if you, on your third consecutive year of enrollment, you are, you are not required to provide your curriculum to us um, moving forward until you turn 12. And in, in 12, you automatically have to. To do it once at 12. Yeah, yeah, you have to do it again at 12. It's a little quirky um, in the, it's, it's not my favorite part of um, this because it is a little, it's a little odd, but um, so that's, that's kind of the exemption. And it, it gives uh, families um, kind of an advantage if they don't want to have to provide it in subsequent years. And so that's where the August 1st deadline comes from. And in normal years, the vast majority of families enroll by August 1st in order that they can be in this process of qualifying for a minimum course of study exemptions at some point, um, even though technically they can do it at any point during the year. This year, 
Um, parents are continuing to enroll. We expect all through the fall, we'll have not only people enrolling, but also people once they see that their um, homeschool, their, um, that's a bad choice of words, their school that their child would have gone to um, is operating effectively and successfully. And they talk to other parents. Many of the ones who enrolled may well unenroll and re-enroll in their local school as well. So we're gonna see a lot of in and out and in and out throughout this year, we think. Um, another question that comes up frequently is entitlement or eligibility for special ed services. Um, basically a child who enrolls in home study loses his or her eligibility for a free and appropriate public education under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. In other words, the LEA is no longer um, required to provide the services that the student might need or might have been receiving when they were enrolled previously in their public school. They can choose at their discretion, the LEA can, to provide what's called a services plan. That's not a legal entitlement like an IEP, but it's similar in purpose for home study students with special needs if requested, and they can continue to provide those you know, services to those students. But again, it's totally at the LEA's discretion. And um, Alicia, do you want to explain the proportionate share piece? Sure, there's um, a propor proportionate share of money that goes to each LEA every year. And it's based on the previous year's child count, which is the number of special ed students in a supervisory union um, who have enrolled in, in previous years, um, either in a home study program or have been unilaterally placed in an independent school. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not if, um, uh, LEAs place students in independent schools. So there's a, sh a small amount of money that's available during um, for the following year. And it, there's supposed to be a um, kind of a collaboration between the LEA representatives from the homeschool community and representatives from the independent school community um, who get together and say, well, so what do we want to do with this money? And it could be a couple thousand dollars. It could be 250. You know, it all depends on um, usually the the number of the students and the size of the supervisory union. And so they get to say, well, let's let's provide all of the um, let's put all of the services into one particular student. So we're going to make sure that that Susie gets speech and language services for the year until the money runs out. Or they can opt to. Um, provide the local independent school with a reading consultant to provide professional development or some screenings or something like that. Um, it's not a ton of money. And while the schools, um, uh, the parents and the, sorry, my dog is having a hissy fit, I apologize. Um, either the, um, the families might say, we want to do something with this money. The independent schools may be say we want to do something with this money, but it's up to the LEA on how they actually want to spend it. Thank you. So in terms of compulsory age of attendance, we get questions about this as well. Vermont requires students 6 to 16 to be enrolled in school or home study. Um, and this comes up sometimes with children who are um, at home and they turn six during that year. We do not require them to enroll in home study until the fall of the year in which they have turned six. So the school year. So, um, and they need to be continuously enrolled in either school or home study up until the age of 16. Um, and school, as we know, can take many, many, many forms, but, um, but those are the two options. Um, the AOE interprets a student as enrolled in home study, that's their primary enrollment, if 60% or more of their core academic subjects are taught via home study, via the parents or through the parents through some curriculum that they've bought or whatever. Um, Non-core subjects include fine arts, PE, and health. You don't have to co uh, cover those topics after age 12. And we've had a lot of questions this year with COVID um, around um, whether home study students can access their schools, public school courses and extracurricular activities. The law is very clear, Vermont statute is very clear that students who are in, um, enrolled in home study can access or should be allowed to access on the same basis as other full-time LEA students, courses and extracurricular activities offered by the LEA. Um, and school boards are required to have policies governing access of homeschool students to both academic courses and extracurriculars. 
the question now is with COVID, a number of, of home study parents have contacted us and said, well, I, you know, I want my student to take art in the school or I want him to take math and I'm being told he can't. The agency's position is that while the board, state board rule does require schools to accept part-time enrollment from home study students, quote unquote, on the same basis as full-time students, this rule doesn't grant home study students an absolute right to access any particular course or section of a course. And, um, and obviously each board's policies will govern, but they can deny access to courses due to logistical limits, like with these pods, if they're you know, prioritizing their own students and they only have room for six per pod per course, or if there's public health and safety considerations, like we're not letting anyone who's not an enrolled student or teacher into our building, um, then they can say that that's a reason to deny access to a particular activity or course. Um, we would encourage LEAs to consider, for example, if they if the student wanted, say, calculus and they couldn't get access to calculus and they're offering a virtual option for calculus to some of the LEA students, we would encourage the LEA to think about offering that option as well to the home study student who couldn't get into the in-person course, something like that. But, um, but we are not at this time um, interpreting that requirement to say that that uh, home study students have a right, so to speak, to take what they want to take in the school and do what they want to do in the school. Um, that that's a they have a right, but it's limited, or it has limitations, li uh, reasonable limitations. So, just to, to clarify, um, is there a limit where I'm now really considered enrolled, but I'm just not coming all the time? So, is it if I take sixty percent of my class, sixty percent of my uh, work is in the public school. You let me into the public school programs. Um, is there a place where I'm just called enrolled as a public school student? If you're doing 60% of your work in the public school, you're not a home study student because you have to do at least 60% of your work, um, your core academic subjects in, you know, not in the school to be considered home study. Okay. Um, so if there are part-time students in school. There always are. They're enrolled in school. They're um, maybe they're doing like work study where they only need three courses to graduate, and they're taking you know two in the fall and one in the spring, and they're doing internships and whatever. Those students are enrolled in their in their school, but on a part-time basis. So um, so that's that's not home study. But as soon as 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 long as they're doing at least sixty percent of their core subjects through not through the school, through their um, their family or whatever their family organizes um, through their minimum course of study, then they're considered home study. So zero to 40% um, in, the, in the public program, you would still be considered or you would be required to do home study. You'd be required to apply for home study. Uh, sure, you're required. That's a good question. I mean, if you were taking, if you were a high school student and you only needed to take a, a small amount of courses to graduate, that that's let's say three courses that might be less than 40 percent of a full-time course load um I, and you know if the school allows you to do that i don't think they would say you're a home study student or that you have to enroll in home study it's just that you're you're now attending your high school part-time you know because that's all you need and the school has allowed you to do that if we move so, alicia, of alicia can you clarify that I, i'm You're muted, Alicia. Sorry about that. Um, so Anne's, Anne's right. If you you know if you're only enrolled in one or two classes at the high school and that's really all you need to graduate, then you're considered a part-time student. So what's interesting about home study is you have to do every single year, all year long, you have to do reading and writing. You have to do math. You have to do science. You have to do literature, and you have to do um, your history, government, and civics. You have to do that all year long to be enrolled in a home study program. So if all you need is maybe calculus and Western Civ, um, then you're probably just gonna wanna take those at the, at the public school because you're not considered enrolling in, in a home study program because you're not taking all of these other pieces. So you can, there, there is a way for families to, to meet with the guidance department in their high schools to be able to look at what types of activities and courses the kids have taken during the during their homeschool years 
and kind of work that into a transcript. So there are opportunities for kids who have been homeschooled to receive a public school diploma because we don't issue diplomas at the state level. We just give them what's called a verification letter to say, hey, yeah, you've been enrolled for this amount of time and you've completed all of your requirements um, and here's, here's your letter, but it's not a diploma. I don't know if that helps. The diploma is, is delivered by the school. It can be, it's not an automatic. Um, so if, if families work with their local high school because they want a diploma, then they can talk about, you know, what classes they've taken during homeschool and what things have they learned and does it kind of meet, meet the requirements for graduation in a public school? Or I suppose they could probably do an independent school as well if they wanted to like St. J Academy or Linden Institute. Um, but I, I don't know if that's a possibility for all kids at independent schools. It's really confusing this year. I think the key thing to kind of keep in mind with home study is that you're opting out of participation in public school. Now, in reality, some kids who are home, in home study, enrolled in home study, do participate in their local schools in some ways, extracurriculars, a course here and there, whatever. But in general, you're opting out of whatever options your public school is offering. Um, and so, so this year that's confusing because whether you're home or not is not the, the key. It's, it's that you're opting out of being enrolled in and having access to you know, your public school offerings. Before we move on to the ADM question, I think one question that, that some of us have is just in terms of safety in, in these students that people aren't seeing. We certainly saw some pretty horrendous stories coming out of California mm -hmm. um, for ch children that were considered, you know, on a home study when it was actually a prison, a family prison. Um, what kind of, what, that's what, one of the reasons I kind of like that they're in the public school now and then because we get to see them. <laughs> Um, are there protections in there to, uh, in terms of the safety of these children that people aren't necessarily seeing? Not, not really. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we end up getting information from families at the beginning of the year or whenever they enroll. And then we get information at the end of the year to say, here's, here's the status. Here's what we did during the course of the school year. Our students made progress or they didn't. Um, which is okay too. Um, we don't have um, any additional protections for kids who are in who enroll. I mean, we do talk to DCF on a very regular basis. Um, not so much this year, for sure. But uh, you know, a lot of them call and say, um, "We understand that these kids are not in school. Can you let us know if they have been enrolled in a home study program, so we can look that up." Um, the only way for us really to deny a, a home study enrollment, which we haven't done in a very long time, is to take a family to a hearing. And realistically, as long as they, we're not considered an approval state, like we don't specifically approve a home study program. It's really, did you provide us the information based on state statute? So did you get us all of our paperwork? Um, and if they've given us all of their paperwork, the only way that we could deny something is if we call a hearing. And really it's, it's very difficult um, for the secretary to be able to prove that a family can't provide their minimum course of study, so they're not able to provide some sort of, of curriculum. And it's really hard to prove. So we would need maybe the school or DCF or somebody similar to be able to help you know, testify at a hearing to say, we don't think this family can provide um, you know, home study program. So we really don't have many additional um, protections for kids other than, you know, based on family's word. So why don't we move on because we are meeting with ways and means and we're, we're, do have an interest in what the impact is on um, funding. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, Alicia and I don't get into the funding side of things at all. I did try to reach out to our finance folks um, and I got a a little bit of an answer from one of them. The other one that you're probably more familiar with, Brad, has been out. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I had suggested to Suzanne that, that you all would want to talk to Brad. What I did get from, um, from Sean Cousineau is that um, under statute, 
we believe this has been true and I don't think this has changed, but this was part of what I was trying to confirm um, with the finance folks. LEAs received 0.03 of an FTE toward ADM for each activity in which a homeschool student participates. So I suppose that means each course, each sports team, each, you know, I don't know how they define activity, but I would imagine each play, um, drama, whatever. Um, and Sean said that this may affect an LEA's equalized pupil count, which affects their tax rate. However, he didn't know whether it would affect an LEA's funding. He didn't think so, but he didn't really, that wasn't really his area of expertise. And he said that only Brad would really be able to answer whether, um, you know, whether this affects their actual state funding. Um, I'm sorry, did you just clarify that? I think you just told me if, did you say that if they are enrolled in something in the school, it's counted as a 0 0.3 FTE? Is that, would you just yes. say it again? Yeah. Yes. So uh, this is what it was, and I believe this is still the case. Um, we're not as familiar with these parts of the statutes, but um, but it's our understanding that under statute, LEAs receive 0.03 FTE toward ADM for each activity in which a homeschool student participates. Now, that would be an activity in their public school. Um, how activity is defined in statute, I don't know, or how it's defined in, in um, policy. So I would assume that means each course that they enroll in at the public school or each extracurricular activity like sports team or whatever that they participate in. I don't know what the actual definition of activity is, um, but yes, so they do get some amount of FTE toward ADM and, um, or it's our understanding that they do. And um, according to Sean, that would have, could affect an LEA's equalized pupil count, which affects their tax rate. However, the impact on, um, on the school's funding, um, he didn't know and we don't know. We have our we have our finance people in the room, so yeah, maybe um, they can explain yeah. it to us. <laughs> yes, Mark, do you have a response? Yeah, I, I believe it would affect their tax rate, but it wouldn't have any any impact on the amount of money that they receive uh, from the education fund. So it, it doesn't affect their funding directly, I don't think. Okay, well, that was Sean's suspicion, but he wasn't confident saying that for sure. Right. So I'll also, also point out that point oh three um, per uh, per pupil um, is a very, very tiny number. Um, so it wouldn't have a huge impact. Okay. Um, was there more that you were gonna do before I open it up to questions? Just one last thing, cause we've had questions about this um, with a lot of new families enrolling this year because of COVID who aren't usually interested or have a predilection toward home study. Um, there's been a lot of questions about, well, tell me what my curriculum should be, or where can I get a curriculum, or do you give us money for tuition if we're sending our kids to online courses, or do you support us with materials or whatever? And the answer to those is no, we don't provide or recommend curricula. Um, if they um, if they choose, I think Alicia said this earlier, if they choose to enroll their student full time in a virtual <laughs> academy, not a you know, take their kid out of the public school and enroll in some virtual academy somewhere, they still have to enroll in home study so that they're accounted for, you know, under Vermont statute, um, but they have to pay for that themselves. We don't provide, we don't use any state funds for tuition or materials or online courses or whatever, any of that that they would access um, through their public school, through that 40% or less of their total enrollment that they use, you know, take a class in the school, participate in sports, whatever, obviously that's publicly funded, but um, but this is opting out of the public school system and public money doesn't follow them. So no, we don't provide any of that. There is a listserv and um, members, home study members who are on the listserv can recommend to one another um, curricula or whatever, but we don't, we don't get involved in curating that in any way. So, and if I could just clarify, the membership list does, is not a listserv. It's really where information goes out to the families. They don't have the opportunity to collaborate or talk amongst each other. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's right. They do have a pretty active group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they set up on their own. Not good. Yes, they do. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So that was all we had in terms of a presentation. You do not have the spread of, of we, we had an interest in understanding uh, where the, the heat is being felt here, whether it was 
in rural districts, in urban districts, in small districts, in large districts, or if it was pretty much spread throughout the state? I think it's spread throughout the state, honestly. I mean, we've had kids who are coming from public schools, who are coming from independent schools. Um, it, it's pretty prevalent all over. I mean, I, I think, you know, in a few weeks, we might be able, once we get out from underneath all of the, the, the enrollments, we might be able to provide better information about, you know, what's the increase in students in per county or per, well, not, that, not even that, probably per supervisory union. Um, but we certainly can't do that now. Thank you. We have some questions. Um, George Till? Yeah, if I might. Thank you, Kate. Um, go back to your enrollment and unenrollment anytime during the year. Can you give us a hint of what the usual churn is in a non COVID year? I mean, how much enrollment, unenrollment do, you, do we typically see during a, during a school year? I don't know if I could give you a specific answer um, in terms of numbers. I think it really depends on the year. I think um, right after the like the first semester or the first quarter, some families um, become a little um, a little uh, unhappy with maybe their kids' situation, so they opt to. So we tend to see a little bit of an uptick in in like maybe November. We tend to see a little bit more of an uptick after December. Um, in terms of enrollments. I don't see as much of um, unenrolling during the school year in a typical year. Although I, I would say, of course, this year isn't typical, but I've already seen probably at least a couple dozen in the last couple of weeks who've said, you know, we really like what the what our school is doing for remote learning or in person. So we're gonna unenroll with you. Um, and I imagine we're gonna see a lot more of that this year. But I wouldn't say it's, in a typical year, we're probably not losing more than 100 kids um, back to the public school. And we're probably seeing, oh, maybe 100, 150 kids, maybe a year of an increase. It, it really all depends. We typically have about, I mean, last year was the highest number of kids we ever had, and it was about 2,500. Thank you. Sure. Scott Beck, followed by Caleb Elder. Yeah. I. Um... I look forward, as the chair said, you know, the question was, is it, sp is it spread throughout the state? And your, your response was yes, and that doesn't surprise me. I think the question though is, is, is what you alluded to after that, which was, is it spread evenly across the state? Is it spread proportionally across the state? And so I'm, I'm eager to, you know, as this thing unfolds to learn what that data indicates. I, I think um, from what I'm hearing from a lot of families is, they like the remote option or their kids had the remote option in the fall, you know, in the spring when everything closed down and they hated it or it didn't work well for their families. So they're looking for something a little bit different. Um, or, and, and a lot of families have actually said, you know, my kid flourished during, during the closing. And we, you know, kind of did a little bit of remote with the school, but then we said, you know, we can do this ourselves and look at what we can do and provide our kids. A lot of families really like the flexibility of being able to do a lot of different things with home study. Um, so I, I think really it, it depends on what type of services and supports and, and options each individual supervisory union has um, and what family's comfort level is. Right, and that's what I'm looking to find. Is that, is that spread evenly throughout the state or is it, is it pocketed? Yeah. yeah. So two things, um, well, Alicia's absolutely right. We're up to our eyeballs, um, you know, and beyond in terms of trying to get enrollments completed because school is starting and kids, you know, we've already told um, superintendents the numbers that we have so far and the kids that we have in process so that they won't consider them truant, for example. But we have, a num you know, dozens coming in every day that aren't even entered into the database yet, much less reviewed. And so we're trying to get on top of that so that there's no kids in that dangerous situation where they're neither in school nor they're in home study and we don't know where they are or what's happening with them. Um, so we're working on that. We probably could hopefully, um, I'm hoping in another month or two um, that we'll be in a um, position where we could begin to disaggregate the data as Alicia said to, yeah, probably, probably to our supervisory union. Yeah, to, um, to see, you know, where, um, where we might even be able to do some additional 
data possibly to disaggregate it in some other ways, you know, possibly um, by income or something. Um, I don't know. We'd have to talk to our data team. One thing that is comforting um, that happened very abruptly this week um, is that when people enroll in home study, as I said, they're disenrolling from their public school, and that means they cannot access certain things, including school meals. During a typical school year, um, home study students are not eligible to enroll in the National School Lunch Program and the School Breakfast Program. But we just received word, and you might have heard this um, on Monday from USDA, that they are expanding the summer feeding program that um, is also the program that is used by USDA in emergency situations. They're expanding it through December 31st. So um, our LEAs are gonna have the option to do that program, summer food service program, instead of their national school lunch program. And the vast majority of them are gonna take that route for many reasons. It's much easier for them in terms of paperwork. But the good thing is it also is open to any child 18 and under. So children who are not yet in school, children who are home school, you know, home study students, as well as kids under 22 who are on IEPs. So if there was a concern that some, you know, students in poverty had enrolled in home study, you know, because of COVID or whatever, um, they are not losing access to meals for the fall, which they typically would. And that's um, that's one small reassurance. Um, Caleb Elder, and I also want to, I want to love these questions and I also want to make sure that we have time for the, um, Principals Association to present an option to the committee. Committees. I'll hold my question. Did you want to? You want? You want to? No, if you're concerned post? about time, I will hold it. Okay, um, Peter Anthony. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kate. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, uh, Scott Beck um, uh, line of inquiry. Suppose there is a cluster, um, unanticipated. Uh, that's sizable uh, in, a, in a district that may even tuition its students out and only has like 40 students for the whole town, all of a sudden gets a big uh, burst of either increase or uh, departure from the system in either of the senses that you're talking about. Obviously, because there are discrete windows where much of the budgeting, the funding, and the state support happen if that clustering and that uh, awareness of those numbers doesn't, isn't captured in one of those windows, I'm just wondering, is there any kind of safety valve uh, to avoid uh, what somebody would call unconscionable effects on the local system or the local FISC? I don't feel like we could answer those questions. Those would be Brad James questions, yeah. I'm sorry. We, or maybe Mark. I'm not sure, but I'm sorry, Mark. Did you want to respond? Um, I, I can. Um, I think you know, to the extent that school districts lose their kids, there, you know, if it's a sizable enough number, it may it may reduce their spending. But under our system, school districts are going to get whatever they spend. So the consequences of changing the ADM count are to affect the tax rate. And because we have a zero sum tax collection system, we're going to end up collecting the same amount of money. So I, I can't I can't really answer the question you the way you're asking it. I don't think. I'm, I pardon me for continuing. I'm thinking of a, a dramatic increase, uh, and the town is still obliged to uh, school those children, regardless of what prior decisions have been made. And it's particularly a surprise if the town has historically tuitioned those students. And now all of a sudden, it has to increase tuition payments to wherever they go by a, a, a noticeable number, 20%, pick a number. I just didn't know if there was some way uh, to avoid the onerous effects uh, of a surprise increase in, in enrollment. I, I think it's easier to, to track a decrease. Well, the, the, in terms of tax rates, if, if they have a significant increase in enrollment and that increases their budget, they would draw that full budget down from the education fund and then their tax rate would be adjusted. It would actually be a little bit lower. You know, it, it, the, I'm sorry, I haven't thought about this a lot, but the, the issue is that you've got two things moving. You've got pupil count moving and you might have the budget moving as well. So I'm, I'm not sure I can answer it the way you've, you've posed it. Um. Sarita, no, you're, you're gone. <laughs> I'll go 
go to Emily Kornheiser. Sorry, really quick question. The data that you're going to have available by supervisor union, I know you're totally underwater right now with the enrollments in the beginning of the school year. Do you know exactly when you'll be able to share that data? I just want to know if we need to make decisions with it, if we're going to have it in time or not. You know, I'm hoping that um, you know, within the next couple of months, for sure, we'll have um, a good handle on it. I mean, we probably have, what do we say, at least uh, 1700 that we can't even get into our database. Um, and the database is what generates our lists. So we're talking um, January. That's fine. I just want to get. Um... I, I wasn't thinking that far. I was actually thinking maybe November, um, October, maybe late October. I, I'm trying to be hopeful. I don't, I, I don't want you to make promises that you don't work for you. I'm just here trying to understand how we could use it in decision making. Yeah, it'll, it'll probably be at least a couple of months, if not a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. Sure. The other thing is that until, I'm sorry, until we start in the school year and start seeing how numbers, um, you know, enrollments and de-enrollments happen, um, any moment in time might not be a very accurate picture if there's a lot of flux going on all through the fall. So we'll get a better sense of that once we're probably a month or two into school. How much movement there actually is. Which begs the question whether it's important to do now or, or to wait. Um, and yeah. I'm going to go to Larry Coopley. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, do, in terms of data, do we have any indication as, for example, today, the enrollments we have today of the ages of these children who are going to be homeschooled? Grades. We have the data, yes. Um, again, it's because we don't have all of the kids um, in the system, we'd only be able to give a partial list. It's a, it's a query that I don't, I think would have to be built into the system because I don't think we've actually done it by age. Um, we don't keep track of grades, so we would never have anything based on grades. Um, I've had a lot of questions from, I think we're gonna see a lot of uh, kindergarten age, like six, seven-year-old kids, five, six, seven. Um, and we've actually, I, I'm going to say we're probably seeing an uptick of high school kids as well. Um, I, I think it's something that we can do. I think it's, uh, again, something, it's a query that we'll have to build. Um, so maybe again, in a couple of months, two, three months, we'll be able to, to break it down by age. Has there, has there been an audit? Has there been an audit of the program at all, or you know, the last time someone actually hauled this out and took a look at the homeschool home study? Uh, I've been supervising the home study team for six years, so mm -hmm. not in my tenure, um, and I don't think in my predecessor's tenure either. So I would say at least ten years. I'm pretty sure that the that the state statute hasn't been changed in I want to say more than fifteen or twenty years at least. Okay, thank you for that. Um, if there isn't more to add to that, what I'd like to do is um, call on Jay Nichols, who has a proposal from the um, Education Associations. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for having me today. Um, Philip, did everybody receive the email that I sent you yesterday? There it is. Um, no, they, didn't, they didn't receive the email, but I am going to share the screen. Okay, perfect. So before we walk through the, the screen uh, really quick, I just want to comment on a couple of comments that were made by folks. Um, Representative Anthony talked about the, the funding impact, and that's kind of what we want to talk about as our associations. So if a student, um, you know, Mark is right that there's there's not the overall impact that that you would think because it's not in real time. It always trails by a year. So for those schools that have more students come in than they're anticipating, the ADM will catch up to them a year later and they will have to make some budget adjustments for kids coming in. However, it's a lot easier to adjust for a few kids coming into a classroom than it is for losing several kids. Because when you lose a number of kids, you've also got budget implications there in terms of, of your staffing. So if you have to add a couple of kids to a class, it's not as big a deal as it is if you start losing students, which is why we are putting forth this recommendation in terms of ADM adjustment. So if you look at the, at the memo that we sent you yesterday, we're asking for in section three of your miscellaneous ed bill that you simply remove the reference 
due to the students enrollment in a home study program. We are finding that students are leaving public schools in some towns. It may not necessarily be because of homeschool enrollment. There are several examples where students are going from a public school to a private or religious school in, the, in that community or a, or a community close by. And they're doing so primarily because that other school is having full in-person instruction at the beginning of the year. Many of these schools believe that students are gonna come back to them within a few weeks. The way that we capture average daily membership in the state of Vermont is on the 11th day of school through the 30th day of school, we count the number of students that are enrolled on those days that are actually in attendance on those days. Now, I'm not a great math person, but my, but my numbers that's somewhere around October 8th or October 9th, somewhere around there is when that's gonna end. It's very possible that a number of students will return to the public schools after October 9th. And everybody believes that this is the case, um, especially in places that are opening remote. We believe and our medical community believes that the data is going to show that reopening schools is very safe in Vermont and that kids are going to return to schools when they go to in-person instruction. So because of that, we are asking that a provision be put in that would allow for schools not to be harmed if they lose students. Because we really think the schools that are losing students may lose students in September and early October, but that over the course of the year, the loss is gonna be negligible. Um, this is consistent with what the AOE has suggested. Dan French and I talked about this yesterday. And I also believe it is in the version of the Senate miscellaneous ed bill, they've taken this recommendation and that's built into their first draft. Mm. And I take any questions about that or any thoughts on homeschooling. I will add on the homeschooling part for the extracurricular piece, um, the VPA works with homeschool parents and schools all the time. Uh, students that don't do anything else in school but wanna play soccer and reside in that town, you know, we help the school uh, make that happen for kids. Thank you. So the language in this bill, uh, in this this memo, is language that our committee our committees reviewed um, last week, and you're recommending that we strike the the home study portion and keep it broader. Right, and it's all about stability, uh, Madam Chairperson, because. It's such a flux year. Let's do whatever we can to make it stable for people so they can plan as they go into budgeting season. Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Ansel. Got it. Um, so I'm looking at the language and I am puzzled what it means if you take that phrase out. Um, and I also noticed that the title of that section refers to home study. So I, I just, um, I'm trying to understand if that language is gone, what happens? And if you, I'm happy to hear Jay tell me, but I also wonder if you could have Mark respond to that. And I, I would just say quick, uh, Representative Ansel, that I wouldn't even call the title, I would just call it ADM adjustment. I won't have the decline in student enrollment due to home study. It'd just be decline in student enrollment would be my answer. Not sure if Mark wants to add to that or not. Uh, sure. So, so I think the impact would be that um, any district that loses kids, you wouldn't reflect that in their ADM count. But since we have to raise the same amount of money, you're going to be providing a lower tax rate to the districts that lose a lot of kids, but it's going to be made up for with a tax rate increase in the districts that have gained kids or only lost a few kids. So you're spreading it out. Whether that creates stability or not, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's but it's. Um, we're going to raise the same amount of money. We don't have any money following kids. So this would just affect the tax rate in towns that lose a significant number of kids. It's not that different than the provision that we just repealed in um, the, at the end of June that provided a three and a half percent hold harmless for um, districts that lost kids. Um, this would go a little bit further and say if you lose any any loss of kids would not be counted. If, oh, if, uh, well, just a clarification so that what this is intended to do, whatever the caption says, is to basically freeze enrollment at last year's level. So it doesn't matter why you might lose kids. Um, I'm trying to understand it, it, it does it, maybe it doesn't freeze it. It says that so if you gain kids, those get counted. Is that correct? I think so. 
Yes. But if you lose them, it doesn't get counted. I, I just, I, I can't imagine how we could decide based on what we know right now that this is a fair outcome. Um, just that so many unknowns about it and reasons why uh, there might be an increase um, or why there might be decreases. But anyway, okay. And I, I want to get to Scott Beck, but I see that um, Jim Demaray has a comment, so I, I'd like to go to, to Jim first. Okay, two comments. I think this language here doesn't work as it's intended to work, um, because this would mean that for all the seniors who graduated, they're not going to be counted, right? right? Be, they'll all have to be counted back in. So I think this issue with the drafting but the other thing is, uh, there's another version of this, which is the secretary's proposal, which is what the Senate Education has, which basically says that the count for this year will be no less than the count for last year. Not, not what this says, but that's what, that, that's what the secretary came in with. So when uh, Jane mentioned something similar happening, it's not the same as this, it's the secretary's proposal and it's different than this, but this is for planning purposes. And we looked at that as one of the three proposals last week. Um, yeah. Scott Beck, I want to get to you. Thank you. Um, you know, the way I read this language is what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a whole bunch of double counting of students. Uh, you know, the normal churn in school districts throughout the state of Vermont where Kid, uh, parents move, families move from one town to the next. I know my district, I think they said one seventh of our students move in or out of the district every year. That might be high relative to other districts around the state, but you're gonna have all this double counting, thousands of kids that are gonna be counted for two districts, where they left, where they where they went to. What do you think, Mr. And, uh, and in the end, you're gonna have to rectify that. This would just, I think would just put a whole bunch of instability into, uh, ADM counts and tax rates in the next couple of years for districts. No, Mr. Murphy. No, Mr. Murphy. Are you one of the best dogs? Uh, Jim, could you right. mute? <laughs> Jim, Jim Maslin, could you mute? <laughs> did I make it over Jim there? You did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jim, was, Jim was a little bit more entertaining than you, but, um, but we, we got the information. <laughs> Did you, have, Scott, did you have a question for me? No, I was just wondering why you're more entertaining than I am. Oh, geez, am I don't know. I've got dogs and cats here, even if you can't see them. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, so I, I guess, wait a minute, Peter Conlon, excuse me. Yeah, thanks. I've raised my hand and taken it down as, as my question gets answered. I'm just, it, it I think that this would not take into account or would take into account, I need some clarification, a school's natural, well, in most cases in Vermont right now, natural decline that is going on year to year as larger classes um, graduate and smaller classes enter. Am I correct in saying that that would not be taken into account using this proposed language? Mark, do you can you answer that? Yeah, I, I think it would just it would just count any 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 kids that are have dropped out that you that you had in the previous year. So, no, it wouldn't. So there we are. <laughs> That the updated information that we have and the question, I guess, comes now um, to the to the committee. Um, if we could go back to, yeah. Um, is there an interest in bringing back the three options that we looked at last week, considering those or postponing till next year? Some thoughts on that? I think I'll, I'll just, I'll chime in. I, I think that, um, you know, that the option of letting, um, letting people count and a student towards their ADM count, um, if they were a homeschool or if they were a student last year, 
Um, it doesn't cause any double counting and it, it smooths things out for the districts. So that's the proposal that- um, Yeah, that was one of the three the AOE sent over, similar to our thinking earlier. No, that was the one actually that I think we came up with in a small group. The, the agency had the hold harmless or, or the use last year's. Um, George Till? Yeah, I, I want to support what Scott just said. Uh, the BPA proposal, with all due respect, adds a, a bunch of kids. The graduating seniors get still counted. The, um, people moving from anybody moving from district to district. I, I think that's, you know, the slightly more narrow um, proposal that we came up with previously, uh, I think, is what makes the most sense and is the most um, causes the fewest complications. And Janet Ansel. Thank you. Um, so this is an interesting discussion, and I missed an earlier one, so I'm a little late to this. But um, I, uh, since the impact of changing the ADM is on tax rates, not on resources. It's purely tax rates. And since it's a lagging effect and it's a two-year average, um, I just feel that there's too many things that we don't know about, uh, sort of information that we're going to get. Um, and also just trying to understand, we don't know how the year is gonna play out until the end of the year. And I don't think any of us can really make a guess about what that is because uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the virus. We don't know what's going to happen with uh, families' decisions. There's just so many unknowns that um, looking at it purely from a tax perspective, I would feel much more comfortable holding off and um, letting, uh, letting uh, giving us a chance to make a decision when we have the information, which will um, still give us enough time to affect the tax rates for next year, which is what we're talking about. Right, and we basically have up until the yield. Yeah. yeah, and my apologies to my committee members who've been working on this longer than I have. So um, those are my thoughts. Kayla Belder. Yeah, well, I just wanna echo <clears throat> what uh, we just heard from, from Representative Ansel. I, I think it's premature to do anything uh, on this issue. Um, I, I do think that um, it will be interesting to see if in fact uh, we do see some students returning to the public schools, maybe even by October. I, I wonder about um, as the fully remote options become more known and proven, um, if we might see some of that. So I think it's a little premature. And I also think that, um, that I, I'm a little hesitant to make piecemeal changes uh, of this nature to our funding formula. Um, just because the feedback loops um, are confusing enough for taxpayers, frankly, when we when we don't uh, dicker with it. Uh, so, I, I, I in general don't don't want to see just sort of little adjustments to little niches of our funding formula. Um, and at this point, it does seem a little premature and unnecessary. Peter Conlon. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. I'll I'll take the contrary view here and say that. Um, the legislature will not be back in session until mm -hmm. January, uh, but before that, school districts will be trying to put together a budget. And I know we had this conversation previously, um, but uh, when school boards and superintendents do that work, they're looking at the entire package of impact, um, not just taxes or tax rates, uh, but they look at everything. And I think this is one of the areas that will cause concern if they say, well, you know, gee, we know our ADM is gonna drop significantly um, as the rolling average catches up because of the number of homeschoolers, um, then they may be making uh, funding decisions um, in, in, in a world of, of poor information or a one year aberration in numbers. So I, I, I'd like to see us do something. And if we keep it limited to homeschool, I think that's fine. If we can come up with a better language, that's fine too. We're gonna have three months of experience with school opening as well. I would just just remind us that, that we have three months of, of data that will be coming forward that we don't have now, that we're making predictions. And I, I guess I would ask 
my school board members um, here uh, that you need to kind of figure out what it's gonna cost to educate as is and be ready to make cuts regardless, correct? When you're making those decisions, you're looking at a whole, you know, how much tax impact can the community tolerate? Um, and ADM impacts cost per pupil, cost per pupil impacts tax rates. And so if you are bracing for a change in your ADM, uh, because at the October count, you were missing 50 students, um, and then they all return in January, well, you're still going by that October count. And so it's, it's just, it, it, it creates a, a certain amount of, of instability and un, you know, not knowing something that could affect those decisions in a, in a way that um, may not be relevant six months later. And it is the ability to pull the lever to say that we're gonna do the count differently, something that we could also consider. I'm just looking at the number of levers that we have on this and, and I'm not, I'm taking up too much time here, I apologize. And, and I wanna kind of see if we can get this done in the next um, 10 minutes because we have to move on to another subject. So uh, I've got Kathleen and Scott and Jay. So let's keep, keep it. Um, yep. Um, if we are going to do something now, I, I did just want to pass along feedback from uh, my Taconic and Green School Board, and I, I think we heard this earlier in the conversation, which is that there are other reasons beyond homeschooling that students are choosing to um, leave the schools right now, such as attending um, other private schools that are offer, offering in-person um, instructions. So I, I just don't want to leave those folks out of the solution if we are choosing to move forward with something. Scott Beck. I'd just like to add my voice to, uh, to Representative Conlon's that I think this is an unstable um, piece that we could make stable. And I think that when we look out there at the landscape at the number of small districts and the number of districts that are bumping up against the excess spending threshold, that I think if we can make a preemptive move here to and do some stability into the system that um, I think that would be a good move. Okay, thank you. Just so, sort of an update on where we are. Um, House Education had a miscellaneous ed language that we sent up to appropriations. We pulled any language related to ADM. So ADM is still sitting in a little spot on its own. Um, and the question going forward is, is this, because this is more of a tax rate issue um, oh, excuse me, Jay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kate, it's not more of a tax uh, tax rate issue. For the schools that are developing their budget, it's an issue about the number of kids they're going to have there between September 8th and October 9th. I heard from one principal today that she's expecting, so far, they have about, they're going to be down about 50 kids. And the reason I, is because their superintendents made the decision to open back up mostly remote, and they have a private school close by that's opening up five days in-person instruction. She's sure, parents are telling her that once they get back to in-person instruction, those kids are coming back to her public school. Budgets are already gonna be, you know, be warned and, and uh, who knows if they'll be able to make those adjustments. The reason we had the go student provision previously, which I testified against many times, was to protect schools from rapid changes like this. And I think we're in a situation where some schools are gonna get hit very hard by kids leaving for private schools and then coming back and budgets already being developed. That, that's my biggest worry, not just homeschool. Okay, here we are, Representative Ansel. <laughs> we we've currently um, have language in the document. Um, can, can I, um, I mean, the, the, the impact of changing the ADM is, ADM is a tax rate question. Budgets are budgets. I, I understand that they connect when you're putting the budget together, but um, I, I think the treatment of ADM, whether we're dealing with it with homeschoolers or we're trying to freeze it as the uh, Principals Association has suggested to, at last year's, sort of at last year's level, um, 
really, I, I understand how hard it is for school boards to be able to develop budgets given all the uncertainties, but the fix here is entirely tax rates. Um, the budget question is gonna be there regardless if you have students coming in or students leaving or whatever, um, but I, I do think this is a tax rate issue. Um, George Till. It is both budgets and ADM affect the tax rate. But I think, you know, the, to me, one of the important things is how many prescriptions am I going to have to write for Valium for school board members, and superintendents, and, you know, it's, we're providing a lot of anxiety to people here. And, I, you know, I, I think we can avoid that by giving them a little bit of certainty around one year. Yes, it's buffered by being ADM over two years, but, but the anxiety right now is palpable. And I think, you know, just as we set the tax rate early in the, you know, our session this year to give people stability, comfort, I think it's important that we, that's why I think this is important. And yes, I think it'd be fine if we said, um, homeschooling and transfer to private schools. Um, I, I think that, that if it's that many happening going to private schools, there are some small districts that this is going to be really, really painful for, I'm afraid. So, um, you know, just, I, I don't know how, how I can say it more strongly, but I really think we need to do something um, to protect people. So, I, but my opinion is. is is the school districts are looking for a signal mm -hmm. that we're going to do something. They're looking for a signal. Um, I'm just not sure if the, 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 it's Valium that they need, or perhaps they need something else, like surgery. <laughs> OK, so um, is there an interest in, um, let me just put it this way. Um, who would like to continue on with this process and move forward with uh, a, a bill to address this? Maybe you can do some blue hands. So can I jump in? Um, Please do. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate being here and being able to participate in your meeting, but we don't get to vote today yeah. on this. Um, if the bill includes the ADM language, I assume it comes to our committee and that's when we'll vote. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can do a show of hands, obviously, yeah. a straw vote, but um, I just wanted to clarify that this yeah. is really okay. your meeting that exactly. you allowed us to join. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually kind of hoping that you would just take the language and start working on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Rather than, and then have it come back to us, but... Um... I'm going to have to bring this, I think, uh, to a close because we have an another bit of testimony. And I guess I will take it back to my committee on Tuesday um, and we'll decide if we want to move something forward or not. And if we do, it would go to you. Um, does that sound OK, folks? Think about it over the weekend and get back to me and we'll, we'll pull out those three solutions again. Um, we're gonna be looking at another complex issue facing us as well on Tuesday related to, to challenges similar to these as in school districts that don't have a budget going forward. Are you saying goodbye to us now? Excuse me? Are you trying to say goodbye to us now? We, yes, if you don't want to stay and hear about um, how things are going with after school, we'd love to have you stay, but otherwise okay. we'll move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> we get all the easy issues. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, I followed up on a conversation that happened up in House Human Services. They were looking at um, what's happening with the hubs that are being created around the state um, and how that interplays with um, care for our students when school is actually not in operation. So I wanted to invite um, Holly Morehouse and Amy Schollenberger in to give us an update on that. 
So I don't know who wants to start, Amy or, or Holly. I would start if it's okay with you, Madam Chair. Please do. Hi, everyone. Uh, for the record, uh, I am Amy Schollenberger, and I am here representing uh, Vermont After School. Um, so first of all, before I start, um, I know everybody says it, but thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, I've been following your committee quite a bit and uh, really appreciating the the deep discussions and, and actions that you're all taking. So thanks for that on a variety of topics. Um, we're here, of course, as, as the chairwoman said, to give you an update on after school. And I will specifically say right up front, we're also here to um, ask you all to pass, uh, once again, to ask you to pass S-335, which is on your wall from the Senate. Um, and I'll, I'll mention, I'll say why in a minute. Um, but, but I wanted to say that up front because it is really one of our top priorities. So um, Holly's going to be able to answer the more detailed um, information about what's going on with the hubs, but I, I kind of wanted to give you the context of what's going on with your process um, because I know that many of you don't get a chance to quote unquote visit the other rooms in the building. Um, so the, the hub program rolled out um, just a few weeks ago, the Agency of Human Services um, got permission from Joint Fiscal Office, Joint Fiscal Committee, sorry, to spend um, $12 million to create a program to cover um, the childcare needs of school age children on basically remote learning days uh, for working parents. Um, that program, what the, the money was approved by joint fiscal, but when they approved the money, they basically said, we want our policy committees to weigh in on the, the program, how it's rolling out, um, because joint fiscal recognized at the time that they, and I'm not putting this out loud, we're, we're not a policy idea, but we want the policy committees to weigh in. Um, the way the program is rolling out is the Agency of Human Services is contracting with Vermont After School and with Let's Grow Kids as a public-private partnership to help figure out how to get these programs online and make sure that they're safe and they're meeting standards and that parents can get referred to them and all of that. Uh, but the program is being administered through the agency, uh, through DCF. So the money is flowing through the state, not through the private partners. And um, Holly and other and folks from DCF have been into committees to provide updates specifically in Senate Health and Welfare and House Human Services. So just to let you know the context of the process that's happening, um, yeah, I think it was yesterday up in House Human Services, um, there was uh, an update given and a lot of discussion about the fact that this program is, is actually only designed to be in place through December. So, so there's this issue that, you know, come December, there's no expectation or requirement that whatever programs have signed up for this particular program will continue providing care for um, kids, youth uh, on remote learning days. They might or might not. Hence our uh, request to move S-335. So way back in January, the governor gave his speech and he said, we really need to focus on you getting a system of after school care uh, and summer care in place for families uh, it, that's that's more universal than it is right now. Vermont After School has been advocating for that for a while. The bill came from basically from the governor. It started on the Senate side and Senate Ed. The idea is to create, they're calling it a task force in, a, in the bill that would really look at how can we do this and come back to you all with a plan in December. So the bill doesn't move any specific policy forward. It just tells a smart group of people to come back with a plan. Um, obviously you didn't 
for good reasons. You might not have thought this was urgent um, a couple of weeks ago, but now that this um, after school hub program is is sort of being built as the plane is taking off the runway and we're seeing all the different places where we really need to look at this issue, um, we're here to make the case that this is really more urgent than even it was before. And so that's that's why we're here to ask for this. And um, the House Human Services Committee seemed to, they were saying upstairs that, I say upstairs, like, like we're in the building, but um, they were saying that um, they thought it was also, um, you know, worth asking you all if you would consider moving that bill. I don't know if they've officially done that, but um, they did discuss it uh, in their committee. And we can answer questions about the bill and I'm sure Holly's happy to give you an update on the hubs if you want that, but that's really our request. Thank yeah. you. We actually haven't, ta we haven't taken it up yet and I'm gonna see, it, see about doing that. I do know that one of the, one of the concerns is um, that what could you get done before? Uh, why would it need to be done now versus when we come back in January? Well, I, I think one thing to say is a lot of work has already been done. And I think it would be the continued conversation rather than one that's just starting. Um, however, the work that has been done in the past hasn't really been um, quote, asked for by the legislature. And so um, I think it's really important uh, for you all to ask for the plan so that you're actually considering the plan that you asked for come January. I think if you wait till January, then that, that task force wouldn't start up probably till next summer and it would be another year. And I think you're going to find that working families really need this plan to, to get moving faster than um, a year from January. And I, it looked like Holly wanted to say something too, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so we, I will get to you in a minute, okay. Go ahead, Holly. Yeah. Okay, for the record, this is Holly Morehouse with Vermont After School. Um, thank you for the chance um, to talk with you all today. Um, as sort of the boots on the ground about this $12 million hub project, um, you know, we are, we are reaching out to every community. We are trying to find um, partners and players that can set up programs and, and partner on spaces. And um, what it is bringing to the forefront so clear at this moment in time is that the landscape that we're starting with is unequal. So there are parts of the state where kids are in school five days a week, and then there's an after school program that's providing care from one to five and PM. So working families are pretty well supported in those areas. There are parts of the state right now that we're trying to set up hubs to meet this need, and we can't even find strong partners, um, you know, that already exist um, who, who understand child care and then the space. So the inequities that we've been talking and that your committee has been looking at for uh, five or six years now are so stark right now when we're under this gun and in the time crunch. And when I look at you know, the state recognizing that this is such a critical issue for working families to have to have care on the remote learning days to, um, you know, to have um, programs and opportunities for children and youth outside the school day for the safe meals that are safe, that are following the health guidelines, that we're stepping forward $12 million. And I wish, I really wish that we had been given the task, you know, two months ago or four months ago, because it'd be rolling out you know, smoother and with time to think. So I look at that on one hand, what we're trying to do, um, you know, and, you know, with very little sleep, because it's keeping me up at night when I think of these areas that we don't have programs to stand up quite yet, um, versus the ones that we're able to move forward. And I look at the $12 million. And then I think, if we could have the task force now, they could have the next four months at the same time, we're looking at that same landscape and talking about the same inequities so that when this program ends in December, we're not then in January scrambling for the next thing at the last minute, you know, sort of like how we've had to do with COVID. But there has been a group of smart people, as Amy said, that can come together and spend the four months as we're gathering all this information and we can share who's coming forward and where the gaps are and where the players are at the same moment that they're meeting and thinking about how do we move forward after December 31st 
when the HUB program ends. And the HUB program ends at December 31st because of the federal funding, not because we think that the problem is gonna be solved or that we're not gonna you know, be completely through COVID and families are still gonna be struggling for care and um, that school schedules are all gonna be back to normal necessarily. Um, it, it's really because of the federal funding that's driving that deadline. So can we take this moment in time as a state um, to, to plan and think thoughtfully and have this task force already set up and moving. So that as the hub program's moving forward, as we're setting up the hubs, as we're uncovering the inequities, as we're looking at the geographic disparities and the challenges, they're able to work with that information. And then as one is phasing out, there's already a new plan that can be coming forward in January. So that's where I see, see and feel the urgency so strongly. Thank you, um, Sarita. Um, thank you, um, Chairman, Chairwoman Webb. Um, I just want to share that um, when um, when COVID hit, to me again, the problem, the concern I had was with childcare for parents, for working parents, in order to supervise and make sure their kids were safe, and also to access instruction on days that. Um, kids were learning remotely. And I, I, you know, I was really pleased that the governor uh, put this money in, but I, I re you know, I just realized it's not, it wasn't enough money because I think the inequities to me are parents never budgeted for these days that kids would be uh, learning remotely. You know, they assumed they'd be in school um, and not have, not have to worry about childcare. And I feel like, after December 31st, the, the parents in the lower socioeconomic uh, section of Vermont, you know, will not be able to pay for childcare when their children are um, expected to be home remotely and parents that have the means will be able to pay to access childcare. And I, I, I agree with you, Amy and Holly, I think it's a huge inequity issue. Um, and I think it's, it's unfair if there's not another allocation or if there's not a means for all families to be able to access childcare on those days that students are learning remotely. Thank you. I, I do want to clarify that the bill, S335, doesn't have any money um, associated with it other than um, having a task force. Um, but it does have a charge with thinking about how it is funded. So it does sort of work towards that plan. And, and I wanna take two of, of the points. Um, this landscape and this challenge of the hubs is not new to us, right? This is the landscape that we have been talking about. There are families that can't find care in the summer. What your children have access to after school and on school vacation weeks depends on where you live in Vermont and the family resources that you have. It's not a new problem. It is just in start, there's a spotlight on it right now because of the school reopening schedules. Um, the other thing that's not new about this challenge that I think the task force could help is that when schools closed in mid-March and the governor did he pass a, the executive order around um, child care and essential child care, after school doesn't fit neatly in any one agency. And what happened was is they, they originally assigned zero to five child care to the child development division and then child care for essential workers of any child six and six years old through eighth grade was assigned to the agency of education, um, which you can imagine right when all the schools were transferring to remote learning, there wasn't capacity in the agency of education to deal with it. And, and I had a, you know, 10 days where I didn't sleep because I was like, the, the whole field is being lost and no, no one's, you know, we couldn't get answers and no one's paying attention. And um, and it really requires this cross-agency coordination in an agency to step forward. And, and, and DCF and the Child Development Division, you know, has and has with this, this um, hub program. Um, but some of the, the struggles we're still facing in rolling it out are what are the education school-based programs? What are the licensed child care programs? That we, you know, where do they fall between them? What are the different systems? And what the, one of the reasons for the task force was to have a group that was looking cross agency um, and really protecting the space. Um, because in our current structures, we don't have a space that says after school or out of school time programming for children from kindergarten all the way through high school. 
falls to this agency and here's what it looks like. It's so varied and it's so diverse. That brings strengths, but it also brings these challenges. And I think that having a task force of people that are looking cross agency right now at this critical time really could help to make some of those, those um, connections happen so that the system we end up with both for early childhood and for after school is stronger post COVID, um, not weakened in any way. I guess I'm just wondering who, you know, what happens after December 31st, basically to all families who didn't budget for the kids to be needing supervision for two days while they're either working remotely at home or working remotely away. I mean, that no one budgeted that, budget that into their home budget, I, I doubt it. And especially, you know, families that don't have any extra money. I mean, that just seems a really very unfair situation to me. Thank you, Caleb Elder. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Holly and Amy, so much for being here today. Um, so I, I wanted to just get on to support S3035. Uh, uh, this bill came over to us in February. And of course, with COVID, uh, we, we were not able to take it up as we generally, I imagine, would have fallen crossover. Um, this bill, I think I'm ready to vote in concurrence with the Senate version. I've taken a look at it. I like it. Um, I like the testimony they took. I think that before COVID, we knew there was a clear need and post COVID, the, the work that has been delivered um, in the world of after school and these hubs is just really unbelievable. And, and if we're hearing from the advocates that this would be helpful, let's do it. Um, I hope that uh, the house could simply concur and, and this could get rolling. So I don't always feel that way about bills, but uh, in this case, I like the Senate's version. Let's take it off the wall and vote it out, says I, thank you. Kathleen, James. Did I? Yes, I unmuted. Um, here, here, Caleb. Um, and I'm happy to take a look. I haven't had a chance to take a look at the Senate testimony either, but um, I agree, happy to move this bill along, um, you know, after doing a little bit of due diligence. I think this is really important. And I agree with the arguments you guys make about timing um, and why we need to not wait until January. So um, I did have a couple of quick questions about the hubs. Um, just quickly, I, I was um, happy to see those popping up. And um, when they did was, was um, quickly moving to try to connect um, the BRSU superintendent down here with DCF to try to get, you know, try to make something happen here in Manchester. And, and uh, I know that our superintendent is, uh, you know, uh, very busy, quite rightly with school reopening. Um, I did have a question about the hubs. Um, it's my understanding that the funding provides for those to be free the first month and then parents will be asked to pay um, tuition afterwards. Is That's correct, right? Or did I misunderstand? Yeah, the, so yes, um, for the most part, the hub funding grant pays for the cost for the first month of operation. Right. Uh, and then, but the expectation is that they will run through December. So they could get their, their month of September paid for, but they would continue to run. Some of the hub locations that um, we have vetted um, and moved forward, uh, DCF makes the final decisions and approval, but some of that we have moved forward have other funding streams. So this gets to the inequities of the underlying system. They have other partnerships and other funding streams that they're able to offer the programming at no or very low cost. In other parts of the state, um, it's a, a for-profit model or a different partner that's come forward and there's gonna be a higher cost associated with it. I and see. that is due to the underlying network um, and the, the variety across our state of what happens. So back to my point of where you live in Vermont and how much money you have determines what you can access. And that underlying landscape, the hubs are being laid on top of. So wherever we can, we're trying to work with partners who have a way to help support that funding, but there will be hubs that will just have one month of grant funding. Um, this is the way that it was set up. And then will have to sustain the program through December by charging fees if we don't have another income or funding source. Okay, and I'm, I'm seeing that I'm going to take adding that CCTAP 
qualifies, sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna take five more minutes of questions and then I wanna let you know that I am happy to follow up with the speaker to see if this is something that, that we can take time for on Tuesday. And I need to, I need to work that out with the speaker. Um, Peter Conlon. Uh, thanks. I'll be I'll be brief. I, you know, I I love after school programs. Uh, back in our previous reality, could support this completely. I'm looking through the the, the members of the task force, and I'm, I'm very much questioning whether, with so much going on, many of these uh, folks, whoever would be appointed, would have the capacity or the bandwidth to kind of do what needs to be done to make this task force active between now and um, January. Uh, and so I'd sort of like to know the answer to that question. If, if all of these folks can serve up a, themselves or a designee um, to, to get the work done. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. It's a fair question. <laughs> um, may I just yeah. offer an So I can't speak for the people, obviously. But I think um, I think it's fair to say it, it won't be the secretaries; it'll be the designees, and so on down the line. And a lot of these folks are at, are already working on this, you know, with the hub system. So I think um, this is just a more like a formalized way to have a conversation to present a plan to the legislature. For the most part, it, it it's not a it's not perfect. But um, I, I think it would be great to move it along and and at least invite the people to come in and have the conversation. I think for the most part, folks will welcome it as a as a good opportunity. And we'll do the last question from Casey Toof. Thanks, Chair Webb, and thanks Amy and Holly for coming in. I just want to I'll be brief. I'll I'll just echo what uh, Rep Elder had said. Um, I would totally be in support of this. I think um, after school programs are just as important as childcare. And I do this a lot, but speaking as a parent, this is a really big issue um, for us. So I would uh, just echo what Caleb had said and uh, thank you. Okay, I will follow up over the weekend and see if this is something that we can bring forward on Tuesday. Um, and as, uh, thank you very much, Amy and, and, and Holly. And it's just, it's really a shame that we were not able to take this up earlier. But as we know, much changed in March. Thank you. So um, next week, uh, Tuesday, I have invited in um, people from the Oxbow uh, School District, Unified School District, um, whose budget just went down for the third time. Um, and I think we just need to hear from them what's happening. And I think that they're trying to see if we can also bring in the, um, the first branch uh, who also does not have a budget. So we have two districts tonight right now without a budget, one that just went down and the other one I think has a vote coming in October uh, to see if there's something um, we can do. I don't know. I don't know if there's something we should do, but I think it's important that we at least hear uh, from this group as to what they're facing. Um, both, of, both of those districts have confirmed their availability on Tuesday, Madam. Great. And we'll hold to see um, what, what we can do with, with the after school program. Um, and given that, if there are other things that people would like to hear from, I, I imagine that some of those things will be coming forward as schools start to open. Um, there will be a lot of people looking for a legislative response, which may or may not be helpful. Um, and January should be very interesting, let alone the next week. So thank you, everybody. Um, I hear, I think that um, Peter Conlon, were you up in appropriations when they looked at our recommendations? Uh, so to speak, I, yeah, I kind of tuned in a little late. Um, uh, however, uh, my sense of it was they supported um, the um, uh, independent colleges request. Now they still have to find the money for everything, of course. Uh, you know, so basically supported what we had suggested, um, and actually because the difference between full funding and the cut was so small, 
with um, Outright Vermont. Uh, they, I think, unanimously supported the full 60,000 for Outright Vermont. Uh, uh, yeah, and those were kind of the two issues I tuned in for. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathleen, James? No, okay, good. All right, everybody, have a, have a good weekend. This is some hard work we're doing. And um, I appreciate, um, Lynn, did you say something? Just one thing, I need to make an apology for my ranting and raving on the telephone. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we were not live, I think, so you're okay. I hope not, but I'm <laughs> sorry. Normally I'm very quiet and, you know, I, I don't get excited, but. <laughs> These, these calls that come from your own district and you feel you have to answer the calls and you get on the calls and you're talking to nobody, you're talking to a machine, it, just to the point you'd like to reach through the phone and just strangle them. Good, because you're live now, so. <laughs> I know I am, I know I am, but I apologize, thank you. We all understand. We all understand.